Josh for um, inviting me to present my work here. Um, it's a coveted invitation, and it's really, really nice to be here. It was not that easy to get me here. So it's been, we've been talking about this for about a year and a half, and somehow things uh, took a lot longer than I think Josh would have liked um, to get me here. So I'm really happy it actually happened, and I'm happy to be here. Um, I will be talking eventually about my project, Filming Revolution, and I'll say a little bit about it first, but I, I kinda, we're going to take a, a few detours before we get really into the project. I say that so that you're not frustrated. Um, you know, why are we not yet talking about Filming Revolution? Um, the interactive, what do we call it? The Data Meta, Meta, Meta Database Documentary. Project. Yeah, it's beginning to be kind of a joke, like what to call this project. Um, it's not a book. It's not a book. Then we can say that. Uh, yeah. So, in 2013 and 14, I made two research trips to Egypt, mostly Cairo, but not exclusively Cairo, to talk to filmmakers, activists, archivists, um, historians, distributors, etc., producers, about filmmaking, independent and documentary filmmaking in Egypt since the revolution. Um, I had a few guiding principles. I was only talking to Egyptian filmmakers, because as you may or may not be aware, there are plenty of filmmakers who came to Egypt to make films about the revolution. I was talking to Egyptians who were active in the uprisings of 2011, 2012, um, who had either a history of filmmaking or were working on projects at the time. I really wanted to talk to people about their extended filmmaking uh, work, their experience, not just media activism. This was not a project about media activism per se, although it does, of course, come up. I went there at a funny time. I don't know how many of you are, should I ask, how many of you are familiar with the events in Egypt intimately? Okay. I mean, obviously you know they happened, but I mean intimately, <laughs> as in the timelines of things. So by 2013, when I arrived there in the autumn, the, not only had you know, the major events of the revolution already happened, we were already at a point where um, there had been uh, and there the election of Mohamed Morsi and the toppling of Mohamed Morsi, a huge massacre in August of, of 2013 that, of, of something like a thousand uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood or supporters of the Morsi regime. And I was coming on the tail end of something like a four-month curfew, which is a very long curfew. No leaving the house um, in the evening and night, uh, every night for four months. No gathering in public, no groups more than, was it two or four allowed to gather in public? Um, so I'm coming at the, at the tail end of a very difficult point in the revolution, and by the way, it hasn't gotten any easier. My second visit was in May 2014, um, during the election, literally, during the election and um, at the inauguration of the current leader of Egypt, um, Sisi El Sisi, who is basically a symbol and a representative of the old regime. So, not very hopeful moments to be in Egypt to ask people about their filmmaking during the revolution. On the other hand, if you were, uh, if you were under curfew for four months, um, you might be starting to reflect on the events of the time. And on, you might be starting to look at, if you're not looking, your wounds both literal and physical. Um, you might be looking back at some of your footage and material and thinking about what to do with it now. It was a different moment than the heady heights of, of the uprising, and it turned out to be an incredibly good time to engage people in this kind of reflective conversations, because all of the foreign media had gone, all of the attention on Egypt, the spotlight, was over. Um, very few people were coming in at that moment, and nobody was asking anymore, like, so what now? What has this meant to you, and what are you working on now? What, what will you do with this experience, and also with the material that you have? So I was motivated to go there, 
specifically because of my training as a, as a film scholar. Um, if you've studied with Josh, you will know well, and in fact the introduction already suggests why somebody might want to go at the moment of these things happening, because these are incredibly productive, fertile moments for filmmaking. In the history of cinema, these revolutionary junctures, certainly, um, throughout the 20th century, have been times of incredible innovation in cinema. So in a way, I was kind of going there to see, you know, who's the next Eisenstein, what's happening? Are people theorizing now about how to um, make films differently? Um, what I actually hadn't calculated, and you think I would have, is that Eisenstein emerges after a revolution succeeds. Um, Cuban cinema develops after, you know, a seven or eight year battle. Um, of revolution to succeed once they actually can start um, changing the institutions and the institutional structures. So, you know, uh, one of the first things that happens in the Soviet, uh, after the Soviet Revolution is Lenin declares that film is the most important art for us, um, precisely because of its propagandistic uh, potential. One of the first things that happens after the Cuban Revolution Really, the first act of government was to establish ICAI, the, the Cinema Institute in, in Havana, um, and to develop a film uh, culture in Cuba that really didn't exist before. Um, but that's once they're building their institutions. And obviously in Egypt, as I sort of very briefly recounted, they're not, they're not yet, that is my most hopeful um, note of the day, they are not yet at the point of being able to establish their own institutions post-revolution, because um, if we were to clock it by today, we'd have to call it a failure. Um, but these things are ongoing and unpredictable, so I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not in that um, position to judge. What I didn't go there to do was to tell the story of the revolution. And what I didn't go there to ask was for anybody to narrate this story. What I didn't want to do was to ask people only about this experience of the revolution. It was a very open-ended project to see where people were at, what they were working on, how they were thinking about their work. It was an inquiry of ideas and concepts. It was a way to engage with people um, about their thinking. Um, so um, this is going to come up, I think, quite a lot in this talk because what is being asked of both documentary and interactive documentary at this moment is character-driven stories. And that was precisely not what I went there to do. What I went there to do was to sort of combine my history of, of filmmaking, my skills as a filmmaker, and my, I don't know if we can call them skills, as a researcher, but my interest as a scholar, to sort of find a way to do what I've been calling Film Studies 2.0, to sort of bring together the material one would do as a scholar, um, but to do it in a way that people can then engage with it differently, that it becomes a resource, a tool, an archive um, that can generate also other people's research. In, I'm going to do a little bit of backtracking, a little bit of, of, of uh, uh, pre-project history. In 2007, I started a, a documentary studies conference in London called Documentary Now, and uh, a good 10 years ago. And in our very first iteration, I did this with um, Professor Michael Shannon. In the very first iteration, we started to think about what is new in documentary, right? What, if it's documentary now, what is it that's changing the face of documentary? And we really came up with two incredibly innovative elements or new aspects in documentary. One was documentary in the art world, let's see if I can get this to move, where you had the kind of sculptural element of documentary where you had um, a type of physical uh, interactivity. And this is a project called Cuba, sorry about the mic, um, by a, a filmmaker and artist named Kuto Ataman. Ataman went into a neighborhood, a working class, mostly Kurdish and leftist neighborhood in, uh, in Istanbul, interviewed the whole neighborhood practically, and put these interviews uh, on individual monitors, and you kind of hear the entire village when you walk into the room, 
and kind of choose who you want to sit down with and listen to. Obviously, you can't exactly talk to them, but it's kind of that feeling of being in their living room, in each of their living rooms. So um, you have, in the art world, um, a whole range of examples of documentary projects, in this case, just straight up interviews, um, that are in a set, I mean, many of them are multi-channel, some of them uh, kind of operating you know, in a physical space where you have to walk around and, and kind of visit with different screens, um, but that is a kind of literal physical interactivity that, that um, documentary in the art world tends to require. Um, and then we, we have the actual um, interactive documentary that was beginning to take form in 2007. Now in 2007, there were very few examples of um, functioning interactive documentaries. I mean, you know, there were a bunch of projects out there, but you couldn't actually really get many of them to, to do what they claimed to do, to work on your computer and, and to figure out what the hell um, these people were on about. One of the few operating systems was invented by this guy Florian Thalhofer uh, called the Korsakov system. And I was, I was intrigued by it because what, what you would have essentially are uh, mini little documentaries, sometimes interview-based, sometimes more um, in terms of the, what we would call B-roll or observational footage, um, where you'd have kind of a main screen, which you're seeing on the left, and you'd have other options on the right hand of the screen, I think there are six options there, and if you click on any of them, you hover, if you hover over any of them, you'll get something like that, and why shouldn't I show it? You won't know exactly what that's going to be, but you might be intrigued. You click on them, and that will, you know, whatever you click on becomes the main screen. And you sort of go down, I don't know if this mic just went off, uh, you go down a rabbit hole, uh, and you can't really come back, you can't follow it, the mic just... It's fine. Okay. Uh, you can't really come back or figure out where you've been or, you know, maybe chart your course more intentionally, like I want to see everything um, from this one person's interview or I want to stay in this town right here. And, um, you don't have a tremendous amount of control, but you have enough um, options to kind of feel like you have this sort of, you're almost the editor of the project, right? You, you're deciding how it goes. Now, Thalhofer, I found really intriguing for a variety of reasons, um, and I will talk about why his ideas didn't work for me, because um, this was, at the time, uh, an open source platform. I could just use it if I wanted to make a Korsakov project. Um, I'm going to play the video, though, where he has all kinds of online tutorials, and you get a sense of his ideas. This is a SNU, the smallest narrative unit. Usually a SNU is a video sequence. A SNU has POCs. POCs are points of contact. There are in POCs and out POCs. Through an out POC, a SNU connects to other SNUs by connecting to another SNUs in POC. Many snoos can connect to a single POC, and every snoo can have many POCs. POCs are created by keywords. An IN keyword to create an IN POC, and an OUT keyword to create an OUT POC. A Korsakov film is a collection of connected snoos. So, I mean, Thalhofer was one of the early innovators of interactive documentary, and he understood that you really just needed little bits of documentary to kind of connect to these infinite points. But he was, uh, I mean, I think he was a visionary for his day, I'm not sure, not that many people are still, I think, pursuing uh, Korsakov today. But I, I mean, I share his enthusiasm for the non-linearity, the, the freedom that that offers. I mean, he talks about linear documentary as a kind of 
violence to the material, right? You have to get rid of so much um, just to sort of preserve, uh, you know, let's say you've got 100 hours of footage and you're going to make a one hour piece, you know. But in, in his projects and in mine, we don't have to get rid of 100 hours of footage. We can find ways to kind of organize it so that you may see one, you know, tenth or one percent of that material, but it's available to you in, in, in the, the way of the database. Um, what I don't share with, with Thalhofer is that we need to be wedded to the narrative, even in its smallest units. Um, I was convinced very early on that one of the liberating aspects of the interactive documentary was that we really didn't have to be telling stories. That in fact, uh, a nonlinear story of this type is actually sometimes more confusing than less. And in fact, I mean, some people have been sort of whispering to me, um, it, like at Visible Evidence in Argentina, people who have been making interactive documentaries themselves, think, saying, I don't know how much, how, how much longer this is going to last. I don't know if it's really working. I think part of the problem is the emphasis on story. So at the time, well, I'll, I'll skip to what I've encountered when I, when I tried to, to raise funds for this project. If you try to make an interactive project, you cannot get away from this rhetoric. Um, the third and fourth uh, bullet points here came into my inbox last week. I mean, this is not old news. This is happening um, as we speak. If you want to do interactive documentary, you really have to get on the storytelling bandwagon. And it's not necessarily a, you know, a story with a beginning, middle, and end as Godard was playing with uh, back in the 60s, right? it's not necessarily in that order. Um, I do think, obviously, that um, you know, when we're doing this so-called digital storytelling, we are experimenting with new forms of narrative, of course. And uh, of course, there's something to it. But I think the biggest problem for me is the utter hegemony of story, right? That there's no other game in town. And when there's no other game in town, you have to start wondering what is at stake. Um, to me, it seemed as if, uh, you know, interactive documentary had the misfortune of coming into the scene, onto the scene, uh, right at the moment of the success of the theatrical documentary, at least in this country and in Europe. And the success of the theatrical documentary was based on character-led stories, right? So that became, became the, the name of the game for any funder who actually, I mean, they weren't even getting returns for the most part on their funding, but they wanted at least to have some success, some visibility um, in their documentary. And I think, I think we overlapped at a particularly um, core point for interactive documentary because that the safety of the story, of the narrative, um, seemed to sort of be drag, dragging over to, um, to the interactive, right at that point when we could be separating from it, we could be diverging uh, from it. So we're, you know, we're liberated from the constraints of the time-based linear uh, project, and then you, start, you find people clinging to this notion of, of storytelling. So, I'm not against story. I, I have nothing against narrative. In fact, I've been telling stories here all along, maybe in small units. Um, I think story emerges. I don't think you need to look for it. I think, you know, as the, the stories are the way we make sense, narrative is uh, how we organize our material. So I think it sort of emerges on its own, but that there, that there are organizing principles that you know, are an alternative to that. It doesn't have to be our main organizing principle. And I think we, you know, just as nonlinear storytelling is not a new idea, it didn't come into play with new media. It's a modernist concept that you know, James Joyce was playing with, uh, or um, I don't know, maybe you know Julio Cortázar's 
book Hopscotch, which can be read in any order. Uh, Gertrude Stein was playing with, uh, with nonlinear narrative back in the 20s, right? This isn't new. Also, my idea of, of, remove, of moving away from, from narrative, from linearity, from storytelling, um, is also, it's, not, it's, it's nothing new. And I think um, somehow Umberto Eco came up today at lunch, which is unusual. He doesn't usually come up in conversations. But he wrote a book in 1962 called The Open Work. And he was writing mostly about music at the time. Um, but he considered kind of the rethinking of form, uh, and especially kind of linear form, to be a kind of ethical project. Right? Uh, you know, that, that really, if we, if we want to be responsible to this material, um, it's really, it's our imperative to try better, to, to think otherwise, beyond the kind of uh, closed narrative or, or linear or circular thinking. So, for him, he was talking about form as a social commitment. A moral responsibility to not contain or structure the material too tightly, to leave kind of open possibilities. Um, for him, and, and um, the, the gendered terminology is a direct translation from his Italian, the only order man can impose upon his situation is the order of a structural organization whose very disorder leads to the apprehension of the situation. Situations are complex. The, media, the, the minute we impose a tight structure on it, we actually do a disservice to that event or situation that we're referring to. He preferred a term that he borrowed from James Joyce called the chaosmos, which is a term I like a lot. Now, it's not the same as chaos. Right? A cosmos is a kind of organizing system. Um, but it's finding the order and the disorder, the, the, the um, method, the unmethodological method. It's working with systems, but with very complex systems, and systems that don't sort of close off possibilities, but open them up. Now, I, you know, I, I differentiate chaosmos from uh, chaos, and I found a lot of the interactive projects that I was looking at to be more chaos than chaosmos. This was a project that I kept being referred to uh, when I started doing my work. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a kind of project where people are invited to upload their own material. Uh, in this case, it was, you know, you made history, now write it. Um, an invitation to all Egyptians. I think the makers had this fantasy that hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, were going to upload material, and it turns out that fewer than 100 seem to have done so. Um, and there's no kind of coherent sense um, to that project. So all of the material looks completely different. Um, some is written, some is still photography, some are videos. Uh, some have nothing to do with the topic because anybody can upload whatever. Um, and I, I thought, okay, it's a great idea, but you know, in reality, it's more chaos than chaosmos, if you ask me. Um, I do interview uh, Yasmin Elayat in the project, so you can listen to her talk about her own project um, in Filming Revolution. But what I was trying to do was kind of stage a conversation, a kind of curated dialogue. Um, how do you deal with a plethora of material with, a, you know, not all of it kind of works together, but how do you kind of give it some form, some shape that allows it to, to communicate um, with each other, right? So that uh, maybe there's an aesthetic context that is similar enough so that you can kind of understand that these are all related um, to one another, uh, or certainly a graphic uh, unifying uh, aspect. So we're, we're going to look at the project in a minute, and you'll see what my graphic unifying project was, my, my cosmos, as it were. Um, but just for a minute, back to documentary history, right, the nothing new aspect. Um, I just, you know, who can resist the cat can? Um, the city symphonies were an inspiration to me. 
the city symphonies, uh, and, and later what we've started to call the essay film, um, the city symphonies are organized on uh, associative logic, not uh, narrative logic. And they were as happy and interested in, in the graphic match as they were um, in anything to do with story. They, they operated also um, embracing a kind of abstract logic, which I think, you know, this is a part of the history of documentary that is, is really only beginning to be told in a certain way. And I think it's a kind of resistance to the hegemony of story. And it is, in some sense, um, privileging the idea. And when I talk about the essayistic, I'm, I'm talking about it in the sense that Adorno wrote about it back in the 1950s. Um, again, nothing new here. Um, but a kind of, as I said, methodological, methodically unmethodical process. Um, I don't know how many of you speak a Latin language, but in ensayo, for example, in Spanish, means also it means the essay, but it also means trial, as in trial and error, as in trying and failing, as in open-ended inquiry. For Adorno, he uses this is an image uh, from *Man with Movie Camera*, um, one of the early essay films that um, definitely continues to inspire me. But Adorno talk, uses a weaving metaphor for the essay, right? So a kind of carpet, right, that is tightly woven with intersecting points, but always at the risk of unraveling, right? It, it's not fully coherent in and of itself. It is non-generic, it is multi-form, right? He uses words like transgressive and heretical. Um, but these are the inspirations I took for the project, not character, story, uh, narrative. The form I chose eventually, however, was not just you know, based on what inspires me generally about documentary, but based on the specifics of the situation I encountered. First of all, I'm not Egyptian and I wasn't in the revolution. I did not want to be the one telling that story. It seemed utterly inappropriate for me to, to, to approach the material that way. Um, I needed also to leave room for contradiction, as I mentioned. Um, these are very contentious times. It's a very difficult historical moment. People fall out over the smallest disagreements. But those small disagreements are absolutely interesting. And me making the project meant that I could include them. Um, I didn't need to side with, uh, you know, somebody who decided that it was worth filming in Tahrir Square and somebody who thought that, you know, it meant that they were uh, careerist, uh, you know, professionals who were committed to the actual revolution. I mean, there were these kinds of arguments going on uh, during uh, the entire uh, uprising, the two years of, of actions in the street film or not to film ended up being a very important node in, in the website. I wanted there to be those disagreements and I wanted them to be able to coexist, um, as I say, in a kind of curated dialogue. I was also responding, eventually I did all these interviews, I was responding to um, what many filmmakers were saying to me, which is that it's not time to narrate the revolution, that it's premature because it forecloses possibilities. So projects like 18 Days, and there was also an omnibus film project by Yusri Nasrallah um, called 18 Days, you know, inappropriately close off uh, in a temporal way uh, the possibility of the revolution actually ever succeeding um, in, in a kind of macro level. In 18 Days, they managed to topple a dictator. In 18 Days, they did not manage to succeed, to have a successful kind of transformation of the structures of power. Um, spatially, people were also resisting a kind of uh, uh, narrative closure. So maybe you're familiar with uh, Jehan Nujem's film, The Square. Um, it was made, we'll find it here, Netflix. I don't know, big um, US money. She's a US-based Egyptian. Uh, American filmmaker, and she went and she filmed from, from a few days after um, the occupation of Tahrir Square in 2011, January 2011, for a year. So from the toppling of Mubarak, essentially to the toppling of Mohamed Morsi. 
And so she's got kind of a temporal kind of, you know, unanimity, but she also has a spatial one. The square refers to Tahrir Square, but that's not where the revolution happened, right? It's a symbol of the revolution. But there was a, a, a really interesting resistance to these types of uh, limit, limiting factors. So actually, I'm going to refresh the screen so you see what happens when you encounter the project for the first time. And hey, it's, it's online now. Um, I prefer if you don't try and access it from your phones. Um, because it was never optimized for a small screen, and you'll see why when we look at um, what we call the global archive or the cosmology. Um, it, what it is meant to kind of be a bit overwhelming when you encounter this website. You can hover over um, any of these dots, and you'll see the nodes, uh, the clusters, as we call them. Some are based on people. Sharif al Kacha, and anything he talked about comes up as a, a connected theme. Any projects that he that he discusses that he worked on will also come up in red. Um, or you can hover over a theme and find out who talked about that theme. It was very important for me that there was a kind of random way to search this, to, to experience this project, but that there's also a less random way, which is this list on the right hand of the screen. The list is filterable, so if you just want to look at the various themes that people discuss, you can just click on themes and that's all that will show up. There are themes that are multiple, they open up. I'm going to be changing the design slightly on this um, in the next few months uh, to make the, these sort of accordions more uh, apparent to people. I will actually go to the biggest theme of the project, not surprisingly, filming revolution, and back to that node that we had discussed earlier, the question of filming or not filming, um, which a lot of different filmmakers chimed in on. And you can see these are, uh, each one uh, has at least one uh, interview extract, and those are signified by the yellow uh, rectangles, at least one interview extract uh, on this theme. Uh, several filmmakers chime in on it, and we can then, we can listen, you know, we can listen to, well, actually watch interviews as we click on them, or I'm actually going to start with a small, a short video project on this theme. So Nadine Khan, and you can see Nadine Khan here, is linked to um, a video called I Will Speak of the Revolution, it's a video that she made. Uh, and if there's a red rectangle, under uh, a video project, it means I have either an extract of it, or in this case, it's a one minute project, so I have the whole thing online. And you click on it, and it will play. Now I'm going to hold off letting it play. But that's part of the idea, right? If, you, if you're writing a book on film studies, you can only describe it. But if you're doing an interactive project, like, why not? Why not be able to click on that project, or at least an extract from it, if you don't have permission to use the whole thing? So whenever possible, I made these uh, extracts of the films available. This one that I'm going to show you is actually, uh, I only had access to quite a poor quality of it. I should really try to, to see if I can't get a, an upgraded quality, uh, upgraded uh, version of it. But this is a project that Nadine Khan made. Nadine is a, actually you can see her in the upper right hand corner. Um, she is a fiction filmmaker predominantly. She's only made this one short, um, documentary intervention and a, one other documentary uh, film. And here she made it as fast as anybody could make a one minute film at the moment when uh, a quite well known Egyptian filmmaker, Yusri Nasrallah, was making this omnibus project called 18 Days for Khan. So Khan happens, uh, who, know, who knows when Khan is? It's in May of every year. And Egypt, you know, Mubarak is toppled in February of 2011, and May of 2011, Nasrallah has 10 filmmakers making short films for Khan. None of those filmmakers were out in the street except making their films, right? Um, and this really pissed off a lot of people, right? I mean, Khan only knows Yusri Nasrallah. They call him, when does Khan ever pick up the phone anyway to call anybody, let alone an Egyptian filmmaker? Um, but they wanted, you know, they wanted something fast, and Nasrallah produced something fast, um, and Nadine Khan had something to say about it. Let's listen. 
هتكلم عن الصورة أنا قلت أبص على اللحظة اللي إحنا فيها دلوقتي هي لحظة حصل فيها انتصارات كتير بس لسه فاضل كتير عشان نوصل هي لحظة عظيمة عشان نعمل فيها أعمال جديدة ومختلفة ما كناش قادرين أو عارفين نعملها بس قوة الميدان إنه ملوش ملكة ملوش إطار يتحط فيه ليه أحطه أنا في إطار أي مكان انتصار فردي أو جماعي أو في وجهة نظر عامة أو في حكاية عسكري أو شاب أو حجرة أو شعار أو صوت أو شهيد أو دمعة أو 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 كلها قصص جميلة وملهمة هتطلع بس في الوقت المناسب وقت ما أحس إن الميدان فعلا انفصل وقت ما أحس إن فرصة التغيير اللي عندي دلوقتي ما بقتش فرصة بقت حقيقة وقت ما أحس إن الإنجازات مش مجرد سلع متهيألي إني ما أتكلمش على الصورة دلوقتي أحسن So Nadine Khan, I, I, I realize you didn't get the benefit of all the subtitles, is basically making a film uh, that says it's not the time to be making films. She points her camera to the ground as she's walking to a demonstration and says this is the only film we should be making um, if we're going to be uh, talking about the revolution. So it's one of these kind of uh, you know, paradoxical utter, utter, utterances, right, where she says, uh, I'm not speaking about the revolution and makes something that obviously speaks about her position on making films at this moment, right? This is not what we're doing, you know? They, they felt very strongly, many people felt very strongly that as uh, citizens, and they were actually calling themselves revolutionaries, um, that they had to be out in the street. If they were going to use their camera for anything, they used it to document the abuses of the security apparatus. Um, that was still operating uh, and counter the, the dominant kind of news, uh, mainstream narrative of what was happening. So uh, some, someone named Khaled uh, Abdallah, you can see in the second image there, talked about, you know, the only thing we were doing then was shoot it, cut it, upload it. And we were always trying to intervene in that moment. Um, we were not, uh, none of us were trying to um, do our great art at that moment, right? So if you want to hear Nadine's uh, intervention from the interview, it was a message that it's not time. And I think to Nana, it's three years. And I think it's still the revolution is still on. And I think just putting the revolution in a, in a context or in a frame or defining it or saying, or finding the leader for it, or all those things that they're still trying to do till now, and that's why that's why they can't win because it doesn't exist. <laughs> it will stay on, and will, even although these days, yesterday <laughs> was Khalas, uh, it was announced Sisi is the president and everything, but at the same time, it was very clear for me in the last election, so the revolution is still on. People are not buying all this, and, and in the end. And it's not about a leader, it's not about the Baraday, they kicked out the Baraday, thank you. <laughs> it's not stopping anything. The Ikhwan, the Ikhwan are part of the Muslim Brotherhood, are part of the system, the same. Even this didn't work. They're trying to, 6th uh, uh, of April movement, they're trying everything and it's not working because it's not that. It's, it, it's a very, it's a people revolution. It's not about someone or it's not about a movement. And this is what I tried to say in the beginning in the, in the film, that it's not time to, to put it in a context because it, it's, that works against it. And, uh, so I did it, and I did it out of anger, actually. I was very angry that people straight away are using it and they want to work on it, and, and I felt like, no, it's, it's not right. Now, the Khan, you know, takes a very strong um, position um, in relation to to filmmaking, but others had uh, maybe a slightly different perspective on it. Now, now I'll play you um, escape the media and still sort of move around um, the website, going back to the cluster. Marun Omara is a filmmaker, but that's not actually what I want. So if I want uh, a particular 
I'm looking for something. If you if you've already been to the site and you know what you what you're looking for, there are ways to search it, and you can even type in somebody's name. Um, I I want to play something. Okay. Um, from a really interesting filmmaker named Marwan Omara. He's making a new film about um, Sharm El Sheikh, but his film that was made only uh, 2013 called Crop was about photojournalism in Egypt. And um, he doesn't show any images of the revolution. And in fact, he says in the interview, I'm going to say a little bit because he has a very strong accent. So unless you're very adept with an Egyptian accent, you might want to just little background on what he's talking about, and it'll help you understand. But he says, uh, during the revolution, he didn't film at all. And he's, I mean, he's a trained filmmaker, um, and his wife is a photographer. They didn't take any still images either. Um, and he had been part of a video crew that, for example, even before the revolution took off, um, they were making films with uh, a, a presidential candidate named, an opposition candidate named uh, El Baradai, Muhammad El Baradai, was actually the candidate of the West favorite, but anyway, he sort of disappears uh, off the scene. But anyway, uh, Baran was involved in making videos that were political, but, but, but in the uprising he decided that this was not uh, the time or place to do it, but it had to do with an oversimplification uh, of images, of ideas, of narration, that he, you know, that he really just couldn't bear. So let's listen to Baran. Um, I was in the States since 2011, 20th of July. And even before, I remember in June 2010, which means six, seven months before the revolution, I was doing videos for Muhammad al-Baradai. I was one of the team who was doing videos for Muhammad al-Baradai. And I was, me and uh, as a filmmaker, a friend of mine, and most of us, I remember when we were getting out for the microbus to take us out of Baradai place back home, we was always expecting a police car to take us instead of our microbus. This was always happening. We went to him, we do like, I remember like, we shoot with him for a couple of hours and it was cut it for 20, 30 videos, which was like uh, small videos, small videos, which do some kind of impact. But yeah, so I, it was too much involved even before the revolution. But then moving to the revolution, I remember I, I don't have a photo from the square. I don't have a photo from the square. Um, even my wife, she's a photographer. And she used to have a camera, so I, I had a camera almost, but I never take a photo. I was, I almost feel that it's too big than me. And then, yeah, I think it's too big than me. I still need, and usually, um, even my affection previous way, I usually need to understand and to decide about what I'm, what I'm doing, not to do something and then start to analyze it. I need almost to have a space, and then I could reflect. So for me, and I think that's why most of fiction and documentaries which come up from the revolution tell the moment, unfortunately they have not succeeded, because something from two, they are too much emotional, so they go too much to the emotions, and then they forgot about the bigger image, or sometimes, usually from foreigners, when they do films about the revolution, they just try to box it. They need just to put it in a box. This is the beginning, this is the end, this is how we see it, without emotion, without understanding, which is not working. So you can see, I, uh, I edited these interviews down into bites, not exactly snooze, um, but, uh, but thematically. And uh, I organized the material, it sort of kept, uh, ex kept expanding, because if somebody touched on a theme, even if only one person touched on it, I tended to include it. So we have, you know, multiple themes, I mean, uh, if it felt, Designers and my designer and my coder were really frustrated with me because it, they would have liked to have had ten themes. That would be very well, you know, very manageable graphically. Um, but I let the interviews generate the themes, and I edited most things in rather than out, um, which is not what you're trained to do if you're working um, in linear uh, filmmaking. So we have basically. Um, the interviewees themselves arguing against uh, closed narratives. And so it really made sense to try to find a form that matched sort of that position. I, I, I tried, rather than you know, constructing a story, 
that frames that which obviously cannot be framed or should not be tightly framed or contained. I tried to embr embrace this refusal to box in, as, as uh, uh, Marwan says, um, any simple notions of a revolution in Egypt or in, in the revolutions in Egyptian filmmaking. Um, so that was a kind of resistance um, that in some sense matched theirs, or I hoped would match theirs. It's a kind of move towards um, what I would call an adequation of form and content. Not necessary. Mo many times we find a form that doesn't match the sentiments of uh, being expressed. But I, you know, I was looking for something that matched also this sort of open-ended form of this type of uprising or revolution, right? This is non-hierarchical, it is leaderless, it is, um, there's a Belusian in the back, rhizomatic. It's, um, how do you do that? You know, what kind of platform do you construct or create uh, for that kind of material and still have some kind of logic or coherence? So the cosmolic, co chaosmos, um, was an incredibly appealing uh, idea for me, and I think you know some people encounter this project as chaos for sure, um, and other people sort of find the the method in the madness, which I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for. Um, but it hopes, in, in some sense, this project hopes to function in multiple ways: as a creative project, obviously, and a creative resource or a gen generative resource, open, completely open to interpretation an invitation uh, to users to engage with the ideas of filmmakers to kind of think alongside um, the people involved in one of the most momentous historical events of, of our time. So if you can find the story in that, great. But that's not the objective of the project and of the way it's organized. And I, I mean, I'm showing this really as just a modest example um, of what I think uh, you know, the very, the, one example of the potentiality of the interactive documentary well beyond the sort of digital storytelling imperative. So, uh, you know, I'm going to stop here because I think I've been talking long enough, but I'm really happy to explore the website with you if you want to ask me questions about how it works or, um, you know, what it's, what it's doing or thinking or some element that I, you know, maybe didn't show or point to, for example, articles, which I'm going to be expanding in the next few months. Um, every person interviewed at the moment has an article, so it's another way in to learn about the, the interviews that I did, about the people um, who I was talking to, but I'm also going to now write articles for every theme um, in the project, so I'm cursing myself for how many there are. Um, anyway, so let me stop here so that I can also find out you know, what your interest is, what your concerns are, I sort of put out some of mine. We have about a half an hour for questions on the same. Yeah, Ray has a question, what a yeah, surprise. I think what, what you did is where I sort of wanted my question to move to. Absolutely fascinating, this was my first comment. So I have a comment on the question. I was struck by the absence of Benjamin. The absence of? Of Walter Benjamin. Uh -huh. And I heard Adorno up there. I saw Berlin Symphony, Eisenstein um, was mentioned. And I, I kept thinking of the Arcades project, the flash, the shock of modernism, and all of this nonlinear ways of thinking of dealing with historical events without going to narrative or story. I think that's a conscious decision on your part. So I would be curious to know, Echo appealed to you more than Benjamin? No, not more. Not more. Absolutely. So is not. Benjamin floating around in this Absolutely. cosmos? Absolutely. And, and in fact, there are versions of this talk where Benjamin features much more prominently, okay. or features at all. Um, he's always somewhere in my thinking, and in fact, the constellatory structure itself was in, in directly inspired by Benjamin. Um, the original project was conceived as uh, this was actually filming Revolution was meant to be about as many revolutions as we could fit on um, in, you know, in a project. And so the Egyptian um, part was actually meant to be just the pilot. And 
And so we were going to have kind of the horizontal, where we'd have multiple uh, countries, uprisings and revolutions, especially in the Middle East, featured, and then the vertical, which would be the historical. So we'd have something on Cuban cinema, and we'd have something on Soviet cinema. Um, you know, we kind of got stuck here because I had a very small amount of funding, um, not nearly enough to do even this project, and then actually what it would take to do what I envisioned was something else all entirely. But then I really, I, you know, I was very alive to the idea of the, the um, historical shocks, um, you, know, the, you know, coming, emerging uh, at these key moments in history when you start sort of needing that history, and you start kind of referring to it and start speaking um, kind of across time. I really wanted this website to do that. So Benjamin is not at all missing. He's missing from this version of the top. Um, Can I follow up by asking you, because this is why I thought you were, I was waiting to get a sense of your, how do you describe your relationship? What are you doing? What term do you use yeah. to describe yourself? Because what I really loved about the presentation is I, I, I really like when the back end of the research you show you take us about, you, you show us your conceptual framework, how you try to put this together. In a way that's very road trip, non-polished, which I really appreciate. So if you if you try to give yourself a title in terms of your own agency in this project, what do you call yourself? Yeah. Well, I mean, there was a time very early on in presenting the work, I was trying to, to uh, erase my authorial presence. Right. I was trying to sort of downplay as much as possible, and uh, that that even after a while. It's, like, I mean, it's just disingenuous, right? So I had to kind of dig a little deeper on that and, you know, account for a certain type of, of authorial presence. For example, I, you know, this is not uh, open access. People can't just upload whatever they want. The, the whole aesthetic is very much developed by me in relation to a designer and a programmer, but it's like, you know, I rejected uh, a lot of versions, and I had a very clear idea about um, how I wanted to do this. And I think, in a way, curator makes the most sense in talking about this project. Um, and producer. That's right. I thought the producer came across. But curator, I think, in terms of curating these dialogues, of sort of setting a platform to allow uh, different people to chime in uh, on any given subject. So I set that up, right? I initiated the conversations. I also started with questions for each interview. But every interview kind of spiraled out into whatever direction the, the person I was talking to uh, wanted it to go. So, you know, I set certain things in motion. And then where it went was all, often really interesting to me, unpredictable. Um, Sometimes educational, sometimes frustrating, some you know. But um, I think you know I, I've been I'm trying not to shy away from the notion of, of author of kind of authorship. But I you know it's a it's a pretty loose relationship to that material, and it's you know I'm used to I have you know I have embraced the directorial role in the past, and the way I edited this material is very different than the way I've edited anything else. Uh, you know, I normally make a whole range of judgments um, when I'm editing, and here I kind of, you know, had to relinquish that role, which, if you know me at all, is extremely difficult for me. Um, but so I had to kind of think otherwise. But it still doesn't mean, you know, I can't face my authorial presence completely. It, it's there. Can I for sure. really quick on the definition of curator? It's a word the target uses when it describes how people put products on the shelf these days. Yeah. And it, we're really reluctant to use that word, but that's fine. I think we can use these words as nice descriptors, certainly. And they mean different things in different contexts. The question then is, what is the script by which you curate? How do you decide what doesn't go on the site? Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the rationale for inclusion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that question is often asked in terms of, of these the themes, universe. right? Right. How, how, how did you get, how did you choose those themes? Um, but as I already explained, often the themes chose themselves. Some of them I 
some of them I determined or, or kind of pursued, for example, the first person theme on there, I don't think would have happened um, if I hadn't been initiating this project, but it also, I had no idea there were going to be so many first person films, so I was super, I was shocked actually, it just made no sense, I mean, what in what world would, would cinema about revolution end up with, you know, personal uh, filmmaking, I mean, maybe, Maybe that's even why it didn't succeed. I don't know. I mean, I'm almost at that point. Um, but it's not, you know, I had certain limits. I said already I only interviewed Egyptians, for example. Um, but I also, I didn't interview, interview anybody who was pro-military. Which, by the time I was there, there were people who had been in Tahrir, uh, you know, and in the streets and who were revolutionaries who were, because Morsi's uh, regime was such a disaster, who were really, uh, I mean, they voted for Sisi and they were pushing for the military to make its intervention, which I had already done by then. Um, I, did, I chose not to interview also uh, Brotherhood people, and they're making videos. I mean, it's not as if they don't make it. Um, so my, my po politics, uh, and my ideological inclinations emerge in, in terms of who, who's in, for sure. But beyond that, I mean, I didn't, I worked with uh, the person who filmed about 90% of the interviews was also, I mean, I, I call her the Egyptian producer um, because, you know, she, on the street she organized everything. She wasn't, she was way more than a fixer. So she had, she's a filmmaker and an activist and an actor. She was an actor in one of the feature films that is um, discussed in this film. She's a subject of one or two of the documentaries in the film. She's a maker of one of the films that's in the film. And she has worked on everybody's project. So she was just you know, incredible in terms of because people knew her and trusted her, and because she knew me or got to know me and got to trust me, doors were open that never would have been open to me otherwise. And I, did, I wouldn't have known about so many of these people. There's a small kernel of people in the project who are known internationally, either as artists or as filmmakers who travel, whose English is perfect, who travel around in international film festivals or, or art biennials or, you know, very fancy in all kinds of ways. And I could have just talked to them. That's what most people um, in my position would have done. But thank God I had Leila because I was very frustrated with that prospect and I thought the project would tank completely if I was limited to that set. Um, and luckily Leila didn't, Leila Sami, didn't limit herself to that set. And we got to talk to a whole range of filmmakers that were surprising, in fact, to this kind of little elite circle. They didn't know everybody else. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Thank you. Take somebody else's question. That's a good idea. Okay. Um, hi. Thank you for. Excuse me. I'm losing my voice. So. Um, thank you very much. This is fascinating. Um, two questions. One to just to pick up more on the Benjamin Adorno and the whole weaving rug metaphor is taken directly from Benjamin. I'm not sure whether he, I mean, he stole a lot from Benjamin, but whether or not he actually, in this case, attributed it to Benjamin, I don't know, but it's directly from from, uh, from Benjamin. But the second thing, which has nothing to do with that group, is this idea, I suppose my question uh, what was, who do you imagine as, if you're the curator, I mean, who do you imagine going through the you know, metaphorical doors of your of your archive. So who's the audience, you say? So, yeah, what's the public here? Um, I noticed that everything is... In English. Is in English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so related to that, my second question is, <coughs> in Egypt, or in, let's say, the Arab world, or the Middle East, um, what is the... Do we know figures for access to the internet? Ah, figures for access to the internet. I mean, in Egypt, there's um, a pretty high uptake of... Uh, internet usage, um, but it may not be on a computer, it might be a, by a cell phone. Um, there's a bandwidth problem in Egypt for this project, that's for sure. Um, not everybody has enough bandwidth to be able to watch the videos. Um, 
I showed the project once in Egypt about a year and a half ago, and I'm bringing it again at the end of November. Um, I gauge, I mean, I, I don't have numbers of, of you know, who's watched, who's looked at the, at the project. In fact, you know, anybody can check Google figures, but I tend not to. I mean, I, you know, the idea of, of spying on the users for this project just it just seems absolutely the wrong thing to be doing. So I, I mean, I just don't pay close attention to those types of, of uh, figures. But I gave the response to this project by the people who were involved in it, and it could have gone um, any number of ways. I mean, you know, get stepping into this terrain is really fraught. So um, when I ran into uh, people who were, who were involved in this project for the first time after it goes online, for example, I ran into a few people I hadn't seen in ages in Berlin last month, uh, some of whom are very critical of most projects to do with the revolution. And when, when, they, you know, when they will, first of all, still talk to me, and second of all, you know, be able to talk to me about the project, clearly they've seen it and are interested in it, um, I gauge it's success in those terms, right? The, 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 the first primary audience really was the people in the, in the project. How are they gonna react? How are they gonna, they gonna take? These are image makers and they're thinkers. Um, they're very politically engaged and I wanted to understand um, if I could make a project that would be interesting and useful to them, first and foremost. In the, I mean, I can't speak about the Arab world broadly. I presented this in Lebanon, in Beirut, in, uh, February, uh, and there's, there seems to be an interest specifically in how to think about this project for other contexts. So I end up in a lot of conversations about how would this work for Palestine or would this work uh, in Syria, and I've had some you know very extended conversations in thinking about what we could do or where you know how, how we could do it, and it turns out that you know it's a different moment in history and. Uh, struggle is, is quite different. So, for example, in Syria, it would be too dangerous. I mean, we wouldn't be going to Syria, but it would be too dangerous for filmmakers to even participate if their family was still in Syria or if their uh, connections were still um, alive. Which and I don't mean that literally, but I also mean that literally. Um, they, you know, it would be too risky to do a project like this. Um, and I also fear that it might be too risky to put this online for Egypt. It's not as if things have gone so well there. Um, but uh, everybody, with the exception of one um, filmmaking pair, um, one of them was English and the other was raised in England, that, this pair um, asked me to withdraw, to pull their, in, their interview from the project until they were finished with their film. Because their film was, was a foreign funded film. It was about one of the elections, it was very political, and they wanted to be able to finish their film before uh, going public with the project. Uh, they still haven't finished their film, so I mean, I, of course, I, if, if anybody, if everybody said, please take take this down, it's too risky, I would have, I would have just taken the website down. I mean, the website's not that important. Their lives and their safety is much more important. So if somebody asked me, I'd take it down, but at this point, it's only one interview that asks, and most of the people uh, who are in, in this project are still in Egypt. So, and you know, we, we were interviewed, we didn't, I did an interview with uh, this online, uh, really interesting website that's bilingual Arabic in English, called Madame Masrin. Right at the launch of this project, it's a very extensive interview. Uh, Al Ahram, which is the state-sponsored news organ, Al Ahram takes that interview, republishes it without asking. Um, so obviously, I mean, Al Ahram English takes the, the interview and publishes it. So they're, you know, they calculate these things. They're like, well, this isn't that dangerous. We're not that worried about this project. It, you know, it's sort of a come down. We kind of want the project to be a bit more of a challenge, but they're not bothered by it. And in, in other ways, it flies under the radar, which is great. Perfect. Fine. Part of the audience is Western, obviously, this is in English, they have to be English speaking. I don't have, I mean, we have to, we coded this from the ground up, um, and we'd have to code it from the ground up for the Arabic, right? It, it's not simply a matter of translation. It's 
a whole new website. So I would love, if somebody knows I'm a funder, let me know. But, um, because I don't, I speak very, very little Arabic, um, I gave everybody the option to do their interview in Arabic. A few people decided to do that. One person uh, started her interview in Arabic, and then you know she's looking at me with a kind of, I have a blank expression, and she's having to talk to the camera person in Arabic, and she just was like, you know, whatever, I'll speak my English, you know, and the broken English, and her English is fantastic. I mean, but, you know, this is the project I'm making, that's part of the kind of authorial position, and if somebody else, uh, Arabic speaking, were to make this, it would be a completely different project, and that, there's room for that. How do you imagine people, like, navigate through it? It seems overwhelming. That's Some people right. do get overwhelmed by it. I mean, like, what do you, what do you imagine people do with it? Well, so, the, you know, uh, part of the project is conceptual, and part of it is to say, this is not a neat and tidy uh, situation. You're going to enter it, at, you know, as a really confusing proliferation of ideas, and you're going to have to find a way, which is a lot like the political situation as well. I mean. It's not impossible to, fade, to make sense of it and figure it out, but it takes some time. So I was also, I mean, this is my, my perverse personality, working directly against the logic of the internet as we're, you know, led to believe, which is that despite the fact that people are, you know, whiling away the hours on the internet, they have an attention span of about four seconds, right? Um, this project requires the same type of attention that it would take if you were to read uh, a complicated academic text. And yet, it's much more accessible in a hundred other ways, right? But, it, but you know, you, the people who will spend time with this project are the same people who would spend time on, uh, you know, reading a book about this subject or possibly, I guess, watching a film about this subject. They'd have to kind of put in the time. My experience is that uh, it attracts the people who are particularly interested in the subject from a range of perspectives, and so not just a film studies perspective, or not just a uh, journalism perspective, or not just a you know, visual culture perspective, but multiple perspectives. But you know, it's not a commercial project. It doesn't need to reach millions uh, or well, millions. Well, I mean, it's not a question about it being a commercial project. It's a pedagogical. Yeah, and you know, it has aimed toward, let's say, undergraduates or yeah, that whatever. I mean that it's being used. It's definitely being used how? in the classroom. That's my question. Like, how how do you imagine an undergraduate class that's not in studies documentary, that's in fact interested in uh, Middle Eastern politics, yeah. um, using it? Well, I mean, it would need to be focused on the question of filmmaking that session because that's really our interest. That's really what I'm engaging people in. It's not meant to answer to all right. interests. It's usually taught uh, in um, uh, documentary studies, anthropology or visual anthropology classes, um, some classes that are dealing with uh, representation of activism or revolution or um, you know, really targeted ones. It's being taught in case teaching it at, at Concordia in relation to uh, the politics of the Middle East. But she's a she's a uh, cultural and media studies person, so she can kind of walk walk people through the the ideas. Also, you know, it's not it's not it's not meant to be taught in all contexts. But I do think. I mean, I've had people say worked in high schools who think it would be a great tool to work with, with high school students to get them interested in the history uh, or the politics of the region because it's a completely different way in. But I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person to write uh, a guide, uh, although, so this website is about to be handed over in a few months to Stanford University. Um, they have a new digital humanities initiative. Um, also Melanie funded, and so they're taking the website and they've asked for a few things. So one of the things they want is uh, something of an instruction, not for how to teach it, but how to use it, mm -hmm. which is something I totally missed doing, um, as did my coder, as did my programmer, or 
it's like, people have to figure it out. Come on, we're really savvy. But, so, we now, I'm ta now talking with my coder about uh, having certain pop-ups for the first visit to the website to say, um, you know, if you hover over something, you get a kind of pop-up message saying this is a theme, blue-coded, whatever. I haven't written those pop-ups yet, so I don't know what they're going to say, but I'm going to have to do that. But um, I actually liked, I really liked the idea of throwing people in at the deep end and seeing what happened. And remarkable things do happen, but I'm sure that there are people who are, who are alienated by that possible. Yeah, no, I've listened to some of the initiative. It would almost be like a step Clearly, you have a mapping, but it's that it's deeply mapped by the lines of connection that you established between the bits of information. It's a, it would be almost like a a superimposed map on top of that, like a grid that would that would indicate something about I think a logic that's informing it about subject matter, but I'm not sure. Can I hire you to write that grid? No. Um, yeah. I I mean I'd rather not do that. Is there one you think in your head? No. No? <laughs> you know, the thing about the metadata is that, although there are some you know, geniuses who have that kind of thing in their head, it's, I mean, you're, you're basically tagging things and you're, you're leaving it also up to fate to kind of pull things to the right things, connect to the right places. Um, and I don't even know the multiplicity. I mean, I can look at my Excel sheet and say, oh my god, that one has 12 tags. It's crazy. But, um, I'm not going to know what the other things are tagged to from this sheet that goes on a mile long. Um, there's no map for that, right? It's, you know, we're going to put it all in and see what happens. Um, and this is what happened. Thank God it worked. I mean, mm -hmm. There were about a million places for uh, a disaster. Josh, oh, yeah. Josh. So I was going to ask you um, if you could expound a bit on, on what you showed, specifically the interviews about not wanting to document the revolution. And both in terms of where, you know, a little bit more on where they're coming from about that, yeah. and then perhaps put that in some broader perspective. Yeah. Because at the same time, there are other re revolutions in which people want, very much want to document what's going on. Well, I should clarify. Uh, Marwan wasn't wasn't part, for example, wasn't part of the media activist community per se. He's a, quite a poetic, experimental filmmaker, and it didn't make sense to him to be documenting. But loads of people and, and other people in interviews will say we were filming, um, but it wasn't for our own film making. Okay. Um, there are the the media activist collective that I mentioned. Mosreen has something like, I don't know how many terabytes of material. What they did was, um, during the occupation of Tavir, there was something called a media tent. And very quickly they realized that people were filling up their SD cards, filming on every possible thing. And they needed a place to sort of download that material so they could keep filming. Millions of people were filming on every possible apparatus. Um, but there's a distinction that we're making between uh, kind of documenting in the moment, the kind of, I was here, this happened, one-liner. Uh, this distinction that the website makes and that many filmmakers were making is, and that was not material for their films. That was material for uh, media activism, for what is often called citizen journalism, a term I don't love just because it is, requires citizenship. Um, it was material for the moment, and it was a material that could intervene in the moment. Then what happened with that material? I mean, Mosreen, when I got there, they were, they were busy archiving it. By the time I interviewed the, the main person who was doing all that archiving, two days later, uh, they were afraid the office was going to be raided, they disbanded the, they disbanded the archive, put it in different places, made sure there was a version of it that was out of the country, uh, and it took them two years to get back to it. And now they are just about, I think, this month, October, to launch uh, an online version of their, of their database. Um, they've been working on it for the last year, and that material will be then available for 
for any of us to look at, to make sense of, to research with it. Um, if you want to make a film from that, that's your prerogative. Um, but I, you know, I knew, I heard of a project that really tried to kind of plot this material on the timeline with multiple directors and really kind of tell the story from the activist perspective of what happened during the revolution. And that project just went dead in the water so fast. Um, there was no will to do that on any of their parts, partially out of total exhaustion. Um, and partially because, as several people have said, it just, it still isn't time. And you know, hopefully the day will come when that story um, is ready to be told. It's really interesting to think about these things in terms of um, timing, temporality, when, when one can tell a story. It's sort of, you know, have you ever encountered um, the problem of humor when it's too soon yeah. to joke? Uh, and why, um, and how inappropriate it is. I, I'm often that inappropriate person who's joking at the too soon point. Um, so, so narrative apparently has some of those same kind of taboos, right? Too soon to narrate, I learned, is a thing. Um, but then again, you know, there's a veteran filmmaker who I interview, a fantastic uh, woman named Tahani Rashad, who lived in Canada for many years and worked for the National Film Board, made many, many films. I mean, most of them are online um, in the National Film Board's uh, amazing website. And she had moved to Egypt a few years earlier, and she found herself, she lived on couch in the middle of the revolution. She said, well, you know, what was I going to do? I'm a filmmaker, so I filmed. Right? And she made something, and she thought, hey, these are crazy times. They're a great time. We're going to do, uh, we're going to do a, a, a a multi multi part television series on the revolution based on this one family, two generations, you know, blah 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 blah. She cuts material into three half hour segments and pitches it to the t to Egyptian television. They're like, uh, no, that's no. Uh, and she was really shocked. She really thought, like, this is happening. We want to, you know, we want this on our television, you know. Um, and she ends up cobbling this together into a ninety minute film that was never meant to be a film. Um, but I totally understand her sentiment. I'm a filmmaker. What am I going to do? I'm making films. I'm going to make a film. But she's trained in that tradition, also observational um, filmmaking, Canadian tradition, uh, not that different from the American tradition or the British tradition, right? And this is what we do. And, you know, she had the skills and she was using them, right? Um, but it kind of it sort of fell flat, and right? it didn't. It ended up not really having a proper audience, not really ever kind of coming together. It exists, but. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to follow up on some of what Greg was um, talking about with the, the kind of enormity of the project. And I was thinking, um, in the, this is just a comment, in certain ways the, the site resists the idea of fashioning publics like we talked about, just in the sense that there, you can't assume people have the same or even particularly similar experiences with the site because of the breadth of it. And so it's interesting thinking about um, community building, revolution building, and this is a project that kind of, in a certain ways, it, the, the non-narrative part of it doesn't necessarily have to um, include that kind of resistance of fashioning publics. But I think the size and scope of it is one of the ways in which it resists that. I mean, I don't, I don't know that it is intentionally resisting that. Um, and I do think, I mean, you know, given the type of work I had done previously in terms of my film scholarship, um, this is a much more accessible project. Right, right, right. And it, it speaks to people with a range of experience and ideas, providing they speak English. Right. But, but so in that sense, you know, a lot more people have engaged with this, uh, thought about it, and thought alongside it yeah. than they ever had with the book I wrote, yeah. for example. Um, or the books I've edited, right? I mean, to that extent, it's a different magnitude altogether, and it does kind of engage um, with people, you know, to some extent where they may be at. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give a kind of uniformity of experience. So I had a documentary student, an MA student, um, who found it really frustrating because when you make something, you want people to see it all. 
Now, don't you want people to see that the totality of this project is not interesting? That's not, you know, actually no. You know, it kind of didn't occur to me that, that I would want everybody to see all of it. I'm the only person who's seen all of it, I'm sure. Crazy person would do that. Um, let alone crazy person to edit all of it and, you know, kind of deal with every little bit of it. Why is this uh, down? Um, but I think, you know, there is a, there's a way in which it's not meant to have a kind of uniformity yeah. of experience. That's for sure. And that's the idea is that people go where they're interested. Uh, and not somewhere else. And that's fine. That's great. You know, go exactly what you need, what, you, what you're after. Um, and hopefully you'll find something there. Uh, there is, you know, for a political science class or something like this, and uh, somebody asked, somebody said, well, you know, I want to see something on um, uh, democracy. Well, I don't have a category on democracy. We didn't talk about democracy in relation to film. Uh, didn't make any sense to, you know, but, so the project is not going to suit all needs. That, that's never been its intention, but it's, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty broad in its interests, given the, the focus. And um, so on that note, let's thank Lisa.